Welcome to the Remembering a Life podcast. I'm your host, Holly Ignatowski, and today we're talking with producer, actor, and author Tembi Locke. In her book, From Scratch, a memoir of love, Sicily, and finding home, Tembi shares the poignant love story of her life with her husband, Sato, his terminal illness, and how she and her daughter, Zoella, found ways to move forward in their grief following his death. From Scratch is a Reese's Book Club pick and a New York Times bestseller. Welcome, Tembi, and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So, loved your book. Thank you so much for sharing your very personal story uh, with us through the book. Can you just begin with a little bit about your background and and some details about your relationship with your husband? Oh, absolutely. Um, So, you know, without giving too much away for those who have not read the book, I met Sato as an exchange student um, in Italy, in Florence. I went to study art history, and I went for what I thought was a semester and a little adventure and perhaps some self-discovery, and I had no idea that along the way I would quite literally bump into him, the man who had changed my life, the course of of my entire life, the arc of it, um, we bumped into each other on the street. It was fate. It was destiny. It was all the things you want to call it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and he was a chef from Sicily. I didn't know that at the time. I, I was just new to Italy and just learning Italian, and I sort of didn't understand all the cultural ins and outs of uh, regional nuances and differences. But quite instantly, there was a connection. And I will jump ahead and say that we committed to forging a life together that landed us first um, in New York and then later in Los Angeles, and where I was an actor, which had always been my plan. <laughs> and he was a, you know, a professional chef here in L.A. And we thought we had, you know, what was quite frankly for me the perfect, you know, sort of life. I was living my dream as an artist. He was being a chef. We were in a great a dynamic American city, and then he was diagnosed quite early in our marriage, and I became his caregiver. Um, he was diagnosed with a rare cancer, and I became his caregiver for the next 10 years. And so my book, From Scratch, is both about that sort of um, moment of fate when life opens up for you and bends in a new direction you can't quite imagine, and you answer the call and you follow your heart. And it's also about arc of a love with, you know, a partner whom I deeply respected and where we began a family together and it's about illness. But it's also about family. And I'm not giving too much away by saying that there was um, a background story of conflict with his family. And that also undergirds the story and really becomes the path that I am on after his passing where I'm trying to sort of rebuild and repair that family dynamic with his family. So I am a first-time writer. Uh, this was my first book, and it's a memoir, and I wrote it in my mid-40s, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, not quite the time most people pick up whole new, whole new crafts, but I did. And um, I feel very lucky and blessed and honored that it has garnered the attention and readership that it has. And I, um, I am, and now it's being adapted into a television series. So I, I love talking about the book, um, not because it's just my personal story, but because I have found in sharing it with readers that it touches everyone's story. There's something in it for everyone. And that was my hope when I wrote it. But um, it, it's something that really touches me to be able to connect to people in that way. Tembi, why was it important for you to write this book and share your story? And did that help you to navigate through your grief? Uh, yes, absolutely. It helped me to navigate through my grief. But that was not my initial sort of um, prompt or call to action to write it. I really began writing the book. Well, I had been a writer my whole life. And when I say writer, I don't mean in the um, sense that I had professional goals as a writer. I didn't. I was someone who journaled a lot since I was like in middle school. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was also someone who, um, you know, just sort of jotted down um things that happened to me along the way, mostly to sort of remember them, but also because as an actor, which is my professional training, I've been an actor for 25 years, you know, I'm a student of human behavior. And so oftentimes writing is that companion piece to understanding human behavior. And when Sato was diagnosed, 
I began writing with a little bit more intentionality because I was suddenly a caregiver and I was working less as an actor initially when he was first diagnosed because his care was so um, intense and all-consuming and I needed a creative outlet. So I signed up for some writing classes online and I would just write in my evening time or when he was at treatment and I was kind of documenting what was happening for me internally because um, I, I felt as though I needed a place to process all of that and I needed a place to be a creative person even while I couldn't be an actor maybe. And so um, after he passed, I looked back and I realized I had all of this writing from, you know, the, the, the classes I had taken from the journals that sort of were a living document of this big experience I had had as a caregiver, which I became at 31 years old, through new motherhood, through, um, through his death, and now in my grief. And so when I sat down to, in earnest, write the book, it was really about creating how can I say, it's sort of like I felt as though, um, because I began writing the book five years the, on the fifth anniversary of his passing, and it was about five years out that I understood I had enough grief and, and lived experience and, and, and beginning understanding of my the interior life of my own grief that I knew time was just going to keep marching forward. And my ability to recall and access memory would change and shift. And also our daughter, who was seven when her dad passed, was getting older, and I wanted to create a document for her. So sort of all of those things coalesced to sort of activate me to write the book. And I just, I made a commitment to myself, and I, I, I sat down and I began writing it, and it was really about holding on to documenting and codifying in a certain way with the written word a big life experience and making understanding of it, transmuting it, transforming it into what I hoped would be something beautiful that maybe five other people would read or maybe ten. <laughs> you know, I had no big aspirations for this book other than to um, create the kind of book that I had always wanted to read. Food plays a really big part in this book, hence the title From Scratch. There's a big theme of uh, fava beans and fennel. You even have some traditional Sicilian recipes at the end, which look amazing. And Sato was a chef, and the culinary tradition in Sicily is is huge. Can you talk about how food helped you through your grief journey and also to honor Sato? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, well, what I will say is, you know, having spent a lifetime, <laughs> a half of a lifetime at, at the time he passed away, you know, with a chef, is food is your love language. I mean, it just is. And and I have to say, it was one of the things that, you know, having, you know, been, been married to a chef, I felt like I was the luckiest person on the planet because I had, you know, access to all this delicious food. We always had people coming over to the house because, of course, they were drawn to, you know, his deliciousness and great. And so food was really um, it was another character in our home as expressed through his hands, right, and through his sensibilities. And so when he passed away, you can only imagine, and I, and, and I was always trying to explain to people how my grief was my grief, but then it was playing out on this whole other level around just eating day to day. And, and we all know that people who are deeply grieving have a hard time, especially in those sort of first cute um, months and maybe even year of grieving. You just have no appetite, or at least I had no appetite. But it was compounded by the absence of flavor and smell. And it felt like all of my senses had been um, cut off or shut down. And so it was a very complicated, I had a complicated relationship with the kitchen. I had a complicated relationship with the table. I had a complicated relationship with food because I felt I was experiencing yet another kind of grief because my chef was gone. And so when I sat down to write the book, I knew that food would play a huge part in the book, right? I, it just was, you can't tell the story of him <laughs> without touching on food. And I wanted to bring the reader, how can I say, I wanted the reader to be able to sit at the table with me at our most vulnerable and delicious and exciting and flavorful moments um, in our life together. And so I needed the reader to sort of really feel and taste 
what life was like with him and what life was like and tasted and how life tasted without him. And so I spent a great deal of time really uh, on the food sections of the book, giving a great deal of attention and care to those to those moments in the book. And the recipes, quite frankly, came about because um, initially I thought, you know, when I was conceiving the book, I thought, well, is this a book of like essays that have a kind of companion recipe that goes along with the book? Or is it like, um, are, the, are the recipes interwoven? And then I realized, though, let me just write the story. And then what was funny is that as I was writing, I would often use cooking <laughs> as a way to um, get into the writing process. So I would cook a meal and then I'd sit down and write. That was kind of my writing process. They went hand in hand. And I and at the end of when I finished completing the manuscript, I was like, okay, I feel like these recipes might be a nice companion piece. And my editor really felt strongly about this, that it, they would be a nice companion piece for the reader so that you could read the narrative and be with it. But then you could also have your own from scratch experience by cooking food from the book and traveling yourself to perhaps Sicily or making meals for your friends or for a loved one. And so from scratch is about both the love we had that you know, was created from scratch, but it's also about me starting over from scratch. And it is about cooking from scratch. So it's sort of all those things. <laughs> Yeah, in that same vein, you write about a memorial service that you held about a year after Sato's death that involves some beautiful storytelling, and I understand fava beans kind of played an important role in that event as well. Can you tell us more about that? Um, yes. So fava beans, for those who know um, or, or who don't know, are a big part of the culinary tradition in Sicily. And um, my mother-in-law, who I have, have not mentioned yet, but she is a character in the book. I call the book really a, it's a, there's three love stories in the book. <laughs> um, there's the love story of between my, my late husband, Sato and I, there's the love story with my mother-in-law, and then there's the love story with the place, which is Sicily. And so fava beans are part of the are, are big, and, and my, my husband, my late husband's family were farmers um, from a very rural part of Sicily, and um, whenever I would visit and do visit Sicily, you know, their fava beans are there, whether they've been dried and saved and cooked for later, they're just delicious, and so they were also a part of our home garden in Los Angeles. Um, they had been, we brought some heirloom seeds from Sicily on a previous trip many years ago, and we reseed them every year. And so the first winter after Sato passed, I did what I always did, what we had done together, which is I planted fava beans. And they were blooming, and I had not planned this with any intentionality, but they bloomed right at the anniversary of his passing. And I thought that was very, very, very auspicious and fortuitous, and I couldn't uh, ignore the symbolism there. And so I chose to feature a recipe from the memorial service, the one-year um, sort of anniversary of his passing that we did at our home. I made fava beans, a fava beans uh, recipe um, for our guests. And I did it with the help of my mother-in-law, who I called in Sicily, and I was like, okay, I've got all these fava beans. Tell me what to do with them, because Sato used to always cook with them, and now I need to sort of, I, I want to do this. And so she helped me through it, and we had about, oh gosh, I don't know, we called with just closest family and friends because I knew my daughter and I couldn't be alone on that first anniversary. It, was, it would have just been too much. And so people came over, and it was very beautiful and heartwarming, and we felt in community, and people told stories about him. And there was music played, and there was great food, and it felt as though he had for that day come back to us. And so um, that's my story of fava beans and, 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 and that particular first anniversary of his passing. Let's talk about your, your mother-in-law, and you said the love story with your mother-in-law. Now, you were not welcomed with open arms into Sato's family at first when you first met them through the beginnings of your marriage. But after Sato passed, you returned to Sicily once a year and spent time with his mother. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, so that really is the framework of the book, those first three summers, right, that my daughter and I traveled back to Sicily. Um, and the first summer, I really went, you know, on the surface, let's say, 
the reason that I was going, that I told myself I was going, was because Sado had asked Sado had asked me to bring a portion of his ashes to Sicily, and because his mother and his sister and his family could not be with him at the very end of his passing, and he wanted his mother to have a place to grieve him in her own t- hometown. And so the plan was that I would bring, he asked me to bring the ashes to Sicily, and I and they would be entombed there. And so I, I did that. And I want to say it was like within six or maybe eight weeks after his passing. So it was, I was raw. It was, it was uh, rough and feral. And I was unsure up from down, you know, left from right. And yet here I was getting on a plane with, with a small child who was also deeply grieving, disoriented in time and space. And we were traveling halfway around the world to deliver ashes to my mother-in-law. And as I write about in the book, Although we were on good terms at the time of his passing, you know, our, our early relationship had been fraught. You know, they had not welcomed me for many reasons, not uh, that of, you know, that had to do with the fact that we were different cultures, different races, different languages, different ages. I was an actress. I mean, it was all the things, right? Not Catholic. And so they just couldn't wrap their heads around me as being his wife. And although we had made peace with that and we'd done repair work around that, his death was a new inflection point because the question then became, would we be able to hold on to that relationship once he was gone? And that was really the psychic question underneath the, you know, um, bringing his ashes to Sicily. So, yes, I was being the sort of dutiful wife, (laughs) but I also internally was curious about could this love that we had built and this repair, could it hold? Could it hold for my daughter? Could she have a relationship with his family without him? Um, And that first summer that I arrived in Sicily, I something opened up and something beautiful began to happen. And, and, and for those who've read the book, you know, and for those who don't, I hope you will. And you can take that journey of, of discovering what that was. But we returned the second summer and we returned another summer. And then we returned a summer after that. And that felt like a story worth sharing on the page and with readers because I realized that my story that began on a streetcar in Florence bumping into my into the love of my life that love could exist even past our time together, you know, um, you know, in this form, meaning after he was gone, there still could be another kind of love. And that I had discovered and I wanted to share. And so that's, that's kind of what the book's about. Do you think it was important for your daughter to spend time in Sicily with her father's family? Do you think that helped her with her grief? Absolutely. I think it helped. I had, until his passing and until I was parenting a grieving child, had no understanding, direct experience, knowledge of what childhood grief was about. That was not a part of my lived experience. Um, I had one close friend who had lost her father when we were all in high school, but I really didn't know what childhood grief was. And so very quickly, I knew as from as a mom, um, even though I was a grieving widow, I was also a mom, and the mom in me realized, oh my goodness, I have to meet the needs of my child in a way that I didn't even know about, right? And so my intuition told me that she needed, in order to still understand her father, have a connection to him, it would be important that she would have time with his family and that she would have time in the place where he grew up around people who knew him. And there was a way in which I couldn't give that to her in Los Angeles, you know, even with all of our beautiful community of friends and um, even with my family who was, you know, nearby and would tell stories of him. There was some part of her dad that could only be accessed by going to Sicily. And I, and I kind of knew that. And so, you know, I'm not an expert on childhood grief, but I do have a great deal of firsthand knowledge on it. And I will say that for children, um, there is great benefit to being able to connect to the parent that they have lost by, one, everyone around them being open about it and listening to their feelings and willing to make space for it, but also by, um, in, in our case, being close to those who, who, who knew their parent 
And and my daughter got to hear, you know, people tell childhood stories of what her dad was like when he was a kid. And I, I do think it helped to keep him alive for her. It didn't take away the pain. Not about that, but it is about for young children especially, helping them to process this huge loss. And I think when you don't talk about the parent and when they are cut off from memories and experiences and connections, it arrests their grief and it complicates their grief. And so, you know, I think for my daughter, at least my hope has been that that time in Sicily um, was generative at a time when she needed as much love as she could possibly find and have. In your book, you write about an impromptu memorial service that organically evolved while Zoella was playing with some of her friends. What was that like for her, and do you think it was helpful, and perhaps even for you, to have that impromptu memorial service? Yes, that memorial service was... <laughs> I don't even... It, it, it's hard to even put words around what happened. So, in, in short, we were... This was in the first week after Sato passed, and the house was rocked. You know, we we had, we had were unmoored, she and I. My family was there with us. People were coming and going and doing the things that community and friends and neighbors do and family. So food was being dropped off, flowers. People were coming and going, and, you know, lots of hugs were being given. And she turned to me, and she said, everyone is coming for you. No one is coming here for me. And, you know, on the surface, I wanted to say, well, no, they are coming for you. You got the stuffed animal, and they said hi to you. But, but when I slowed down and I realized, ah, from her seven-year-old perspective, it's all happening above her head, meaning my peers, the adults are coming and giving me hugs. And, yes, they drop off a coloring book to her. They give her a hug. They sit down. They play with her. But she felt like the absence of her peer group because she hadn't returned to school yet. And so she, so I said to her, I said, would you like your friends to come over? And she said, yes. And so I called about the parents of about six of her closest uh -huh. friends. And I said, can your children just come over and play with her and just be with her? And they all agreed. And when they came over, the children, they gravitated toward the room, or you know, she perhaps led them to the room that we had set up as a kind of, you know, not kind of, a memorial space for that. We had a candle going, with all the cards that had arrived, flowers were in this room. It was also the room he had passed away in, and it was kind of the the heartbeat, the epicenter, the emotional epicenter of our home at the time. And the kids went in there to play. And they were just playing and drawing on the floor, and they were laughing. And it was this beautiful for me to witness this this juxtaposition of life as well as death right there, but also the way in which kids were intuitively expressing and um, their grief and they were processing through play and through drawing and they drew pictures and and there was music and they danced a little bit and so for her I think that was her way of creating her own community and taking care of herself and I am grateful that I had the presence of mind <laughs> to just slow down and listen and to um, allow that moment to unfold. And it taught me a great deal. And it's something that I, a story I like to share because I hope it's helpful to other parents who are going, who, who may experience it, or the friends and neighbors, because children really need, they need to process things in their own way. In fact, when Sato was near the end, you write that a hospice nurse told you, you need to help your daughter, who again was seven at the time, understand what's happening because her brain will not want to forget. Her brain and heart will not be able to hold it. Let her be a part of this process. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. You figured that out for her. So what is your advice to parents as they try to guide a small child through grieving the death of another parent? My advice for parents is to listen with open heart to listen with an open heart, to um, extend a great deal of grace to both yourself and your child, but to look for the nonverbal cues often um, to 
to make space for their grieving, to 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 um, allow them to process in whatever way that looks like. And some days that's very quiet and withdrawn. Other days it might be quite expressive. Um, and also to find one or two people who are trusted family members or friends or who are even a teacher who is close to your child who can have eyes on and be there for when you don't have the capacity perhaps to be the most attentive to your child because the reality is is that two things are unfolding. It's sort of like a two-hander, meaning you are in your deep grief and they are in theirs and you can't always attend to both simultaneously at equal levels. And so having a community um, or other people who can help is important. But I think the thing that you can do, one of the things that we did a lot was um, at the end of each day, we would do, because she was seven and I knew she liked to draw a lot, I would have her draw her feelings. And I would just say, and I would put the colors in front of her and I'd say, just draw whatever you want to draw. And that, and then we would look at those and we would talk about them. Um, sometimes I'd say draw a memory that you have with your dad. And so those things helped. I think parents, there are many now and, and more than ever because we have just all gone through two years of a pandemic and, and COVID, there are a lot of resources for grieving children because many children have lost parents just to the pandemic alone. Um, and there is a, a podcast, a resource, a book that I'd like to point people to, which is the um, Grieving Parent, Grieving Widows podcast and book. And it's, um, it's really wonderful and helpful. So I, I just say, be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with your child. Know that Grief will look different day to day, even minute to minute sometimes. Um, Rest a lot. Try to keep things as as, um, continuous and stable as possible. And I know that sounds strange because there's nothing really stable about grief. (laughs) Um, But to the degree that you can, keeping those pillars of stability are valuable and important to your child. Um, Yeah, that, that would be my advice. How do you and your daughter keep Sato's memory alive today? Well, it's interesting to ask because today is actually her birthday. <laughs> so um, she's, she's, she's older now, um, and so we are not together today on his birthday. But normally what we do is we'll have a dinner together. We talk about him often. We look at pictures or she'll watch videos. Some years we go to we get flowers. Sometimes we'll make a delicious like dessert that he used to make or we'll do something food-related for sure. In years past, we've, had, um, we've gone out to dinners with, with close friends or family to celebrate. We try not to be alone. We also try not to uh, overpack that day or overschedule it, usually the day before and after, because we learned, especially in those first years, that sort of like the lead up to the anniversary of a, of a passing or a birthday or the holidays, there's a lot of um, the grief sneaks up on you. The wave is sort of growing <laughs> and it crests on, you know, the the, the special day or the memorial day. And so being gentle with each other is important. Um, But we, you know, yeah, we cook a lot and we we, we check in with each other and we tell stories. Um, We had the first year he passed away, we planted a peach tree, which, you know, um, blooms every summer. So like this year we had peaches on his birthday. And today, and it's been 10 years since his passing, so today we're not together, but, like, I texted her. I sent her a picture of him. Um, I said, you know, oh, it's his day, and, you know, I'm thinking of him, and, and, and just keeping him alive, right? And I think that that, the memory of him alive, um, we'll watch a favorite movie. Those, those are the ways that, you, that we, we honor him and we remember him. That's beautiful. We ask all of our guests who they're remembering today, and I think we we know who you're remembering. Is there something you want to tell us about Sato that um, you just want to share about him? Oh, my goodness. Um, Well, you know, for all of us, I think, you know, our special person is our special person for a reason, right? (laughs) You know, but for, for me, what he meant to me continues to evolve and shift and change and enhance and enrich my life. 
she taught me about a kind and quality of love that I only dreamed of and that I seek to continue to step into and expand. His um, kindness was unparalleled. He had the ability to spike up a conversation with a stranger and quite expeditiously get to some of the most intimate <laughs> uh, memories or experiences of their life. And it's something I, I, I try to do with others when I meet them. I had a, a Lyft ride the other day and, and found myself talking to the Lyft driver, and we had a conversation. And when I got out of the car, I thought, oh, that was Sato. <laughs> he taught me how to, you know, <laughs> how to, to listen to, to strangers and hear their story. Um, and it's something that I seek to do every day. And now in my work as a writer and as a producer and as an actor and as a storyteller, I think um, honoring and carrying the stories of humanity and of all of us is a part of my work as a creator and as a creative person. And he's with me when I do that work. So that's my, that's, that's what I want the world to know about him. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today, Tembi, and for sharing this beautiful, personal, very poetic journey through your grief and your love. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful honor. And um, I thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. And remembering a life is very important. And um, I'm happy to be here to share. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining me today. For more information about Tembi and her work, visit tembilock.com. To enter to win a signed copy of Tembi's book, From Scratch, visit rememberingalife.com slash giveaways.